Okay, so um, we're going to do endocrinology, uh, the endocrine system, in three parts. Uh, here's the first one. So endocrinology is the study of hormones, how they work, mechanisms of ac ac action, how they are regulated and help the body achieve all the essential functions under varied environmental conditions and circumstances. So we have the nervous system acting very quickly. The hormone systems tend to be more of a longer duration, everywhere from minutes to hours and um, things that are regulated across a lifetime. Whereas with the nervous system, we're usually dealing with minute to minute milliseconds. So what is a hormone? There's a criteria that we have to have for that. We have a specific compound um, produced in a specific location. So um, we have um, either peptide or protein hormones or steroid hormones. Those are the two broad classes. There are a few others, but those are the big classes. They're produced in a specific location. And by definition, that molecule must move through the blood, moves more or less freely, more or less independently from everything else. And then it, there has to be a receptor somewhere in the body for that particular hormone. The receptor can be located in one specific spot, spot like you might think about um, uh, thyroid hormones. TSH, TRH, um, or you might have something like insulin, which has receptors throughout the body. So specific compound from a specific, specific location, move through the blood. That's very important for defining a hormone. And then it has a target receptor somewhere in the body that it uh, can respond to its presence. Same thing here hormone to be or not to be. So hormones produced by glands, if you remove them, bad things happen. Uh, if you take that hormone out of the gland and put it back into the body, it's going to have a certain amount of recovery from that, correcting the deficiency or abnormality. If you can go through and figure out um, what exactly is causing that, um, you can figure out the component that's going to get that done. That's how they had to do it. You keep subdividing, subdividing, subdividing until you find what you're looking for. Um, so um, often possible higher activity in the blood draining an endocrine gland than supplying. So you know that the secretion happens at that particular gland. Here's an illustration of all that. Um, we have uh, hormone production areas. We have a capillary bed here. We have uh, specific hormones being produced. The H, we're going to flow through. Um, this may be a portal system, but more likely this is the vein coming back. We have the heart and lungs in between, and then we send the blood out again to another capillary bed. And then we need specific places where there are receptors. So any of the curved um, receptors here that match the H um, are getting uh, filled and therefore activating um, the hormone response versus the X or the kind of a sharp corner here where these hormones don't fit. They're not going to act activate these receptors and therefore there will be no hormone response in these particular cells. So produce this specific, specific place. We're going to move through the blood on this gray highway and then it's got a specific receptor on the other side. So with our hormones, uh, every hormone's got a specific receptor. So the hormone can be any variety of compounds. And um, as it was figured out in the 60s and 70s, 1960s, 1970s, we talk about lock and key. The hormone is the key that goes into lock 
The receptor is made of fully of proteins as opposed to hormones, a variety of compounds. And this is the lock that the hormone goes in. It changes the shape of that protein hormone and therefore affects an action that leads to that hormone response. So here's an illustration of uh, FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. Um, and its receptor. So you've got the FSH molecule down here, and then there's receptor up top here. They link together in such a way that they are going to um, produce the, uh, or get the follicles up and running, uh, either the testes or the ovaries. So we need the, the FSH to go to the gonads, and we have specific receptors down there that are going to activate and start a cascade that allows the hormone to affect a response. So let's look at the different classes or groups of hormones by chemical grouping. So you've got polypeptides, um, usually dealing with something that's reasonably short. Um, uh, may be fragmented in some way, shape, or form, um, but you're talking about strings of amino acids, um, usually shorter than some ones we'll call protein hormone. So here we have two examples. These are uh, more of a cartoon. You have each amino acid in sequence here. So you've got oxytocin, has got nine amino acids, sulfur bond between two cysteines. Um, uh, ADH, antidiuretic hormone, we're looking at slight differences, same shape, um, circle, cross bridge with sulfur bond, and a tail going off. Um, small changes have different effects, so oxytocin will get to what they do. Uh, another way to look at this is with the atomic atom drawing, and you can start here, NCC, NCC. NCC, 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 CC there with the S. So you got your uh, backbone going through and then all the R groups sticking off around the outside. So oxytocin, ADH are only nine amino acids long. So we classify that as a peptide. Both are from the posterior pituitary. We'll talk about that in a minute. Protein. So we're looking at uh, molecules that are perhaps a little bit bigger. Um, and it's, they're still made of amino acids, but the, generally the difference between pepti polypeptides and proteins is you're dealing with something a whole lot bigger. So I'm showing insulin here. This is a lot bigger, but we do have that in that peptide category. But you're looking at multiple chains. Each of these represents an amino acid. So this is much more than that nine, um, nine amino acid grouping here. We have a couple hundred, it looks like. Well, maybe not that much. Now this one might be a hundred, but... You've gone through, you lay things out, and then you cut off here and cut off here. I guess we take off there between the blue and the red, blue and the red. And this is your C protein, if you ever hear somebody um, calling it. Um, I've got my insulin under control because I've got my C protein under control. But again, you're talking about individual amino acids struck, strung together, and there's a shape there that's going to fit into an enzyme somewhere. Amines, these are groups that have an ammonia group in it. So you're looking at adrenaline, noradrenaline, thyroxine. So here's our amine group here. We start out with the amino acid tyrosine. We add some iodines to it. We add another ring structure to it until we get triodothyronine, uh, triodothyronine, 
um, thyroxin. Uh, both of these are biologically active. We have some more amines here, histamine, uh, norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, and melatonin. All these have uh, different uh, ammonia groups or amine groups. Um, small molecules can get where they need to very quickly and get the job done. Steroid hormones. These are probably the smallest ones in the bunch. Uh, tend to have a lot longer uh, term effects, and because they are fat soluble, they can go anywhere they want to. We look at the uh, starting with cholesterol, that's the base of most of the hormone uh, in these cascades the mineral corticoids, the glucocorticoids, the sex steroids all start out as cholesterol. We do a little clipping off the top end here. Um, what are we doing here? We're changing this on this end. Changing this through here. So once we get to progesterone, we're at 21 carbons. We convert, we generate uh, progesterone, 21 carbons. We do an end other enzymatic conversion. We generate testosterone at 19 carbons. We take one more carbon off and we have an estradiol, a member of the estrogen family. So we'll talk about um, steroids here in a minute. The last group we'll talk about are prostaglandins. They are made from fatty acids. So we look at the essential fatty acids and those are the ones that are going to be made in this group. So we start out with um, a triglyceride up here, you got your glycerol background, backbone, you got two fatty acids coming off. So we take the arachidonate. So that's right here. And we add some modifications to it. Um, so alcohol group, cross linkage. Um, looks like it might be pretty close. We might have shifted where we have the double bonds. Um, so same sort of thing over here, I think it's exactly the same. Um, so my bad on that. So prostaglandin F2 alpha, prostaglandin E2. So different, different small differences lead to big differences in functions. So uh, again, the receptor needs to be able to pick up those subtle differences of, looks like the difference here is the ketone group versus the hydroxyl ion. So staying up on that, staying that figured out um, is helpful. So we need to talk about the similarities as well. Whatever the overlap is the same. Um, then we need the differences on either side. So hormone mechanism, this is an illustration of a, a protein hormone. Protein hormones are generally not fat soluble, although portions of them can be, but they do their work on the surface of the cell and then they activate a sequence or a cascade on the inside of the cell that allows um, things to proceed, the enzyme to have an, uh, an effect. So you have your hormone here falling in the receptor here. That's going to create uh, conformational changes on the inside. Um, sometimes that's about uh, taking uh, ATP and generating CM, CAMP, putting things together. Um, that's going to lead to a cascade that's going to go on inside the cell because it's not fat soluble it can't pass through the membrane but it can affect the change of this tail it can affect the change of uh, what goes on inside the cell so CMP uh, calcium are uh, often secondary measurement measures in this so contrast that with a steroid hormone 
steroid hormone is going to have some sort of carrier in the blood as it moves through. Its steroid hormones are not fat soluble, so they usually hitch a ride in the HDL or LDL or VLDL carriers. Once it gets to the cells, the uh, remember cholesterol was an integral part of the cell membrane. The steroid hormones are uh, fat. Um, not hydrophobic, um, or yes, they are hydrophobic, they're not hydrophilic, they can become part of the uh, membrane, but in this case, steroids generally pass through the membranes and find their targets on the, nucle the DNA of the nucleus itself. So you're looking at something that's uh, trying to affect something a little bit longer. We're talking about turning on and turning off genes. We're talking about um, responding in such a way that we're more, be pro, more proactive. So the receptor um, inside the nucleus of the cell will lead to certain sections of the code being amplified, being copied, being distributed. Um, so we think about protein, we're looking usually at more short-term, within-day responses. So um, managing blood glucose is an example, versus um, the steroids tend to be longer-term, longer horizon. Um, it's hard to know um, how much milk is where sometimes in our bulls. So we need to uh, turn things on, turn things off with our receptors in one way, shape, or form. So uh, we're talking about more long-term effects, confirmation, sexual dimorphism under the control of steroids. So this is a good compare and contrast. You can put this in a Venn diagram. So protein, peptide, they generally are larger than your average steroid. Steroid protein hormones are hydrophilic. So they can't cross membranes without help or a carrier. Steroids, we're looking at amines. Um, prostaglandins would also sort of fit in this category because they're fat soluble. Um, lipophilic, they are a lot smaller. And their job is to affect a change on the inside of the cell. Protein has a receptor on the Outside of the cell, the tail of that receptor usually reaches inside to affect some sort of change. So people talk about uh, the protein hormones are affecting an enzyme activity in some way, shape, or form. Uh, there's a um, minute to minute, hour to hour feel to the way the proteins work. Um, that can be really helpful, especially in a positive feedback system. Um, small changes can lead to cascades that we need to get going. Um, versus our steroid, we're looking at more long-term change manufacturing of the enzyme. So that's usually what's under control by the, stero the steroid hormone, whereas once that um, uh, enzyme is produced, uh, protein hormone will turn it on or turn it off. So change activity versus um, changing the presence or absence of that um, enzyme. 